So welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for being here today in this new session of the Simna Seminar course. Um, today we are pleased to have with us Jordi Cipriano and Gerard Moore, who are going to talk us about um, intelligent, artificial intelligence for optimized operation of building energy systems. Um, I'm sure it would be a very interesting topic, hot topic, I would say. So, well, welcome, Jordi. Hello, good morning. Um, well, we will start uh, the, this uh, webinar or, or Cafe Simna, I don't exactly know how to mention it. And um, yeah, and the idea is to, to make a brief introduction on, on the work we are performing at uh, the Building Energy and Environment Department of uh, Sibne. And um, of course, if you have questions or or if you want to interrupt and ask a question, there's no problem, you can do it because it's a, it's a maybe a quite long presentation. Um, so feel free to interrupt us. I, I will I will start with a briefly explanation or or, or justification of uh, why in in B group in the in the department B group we are working in artificial intelligence and and how did we did we started thinking about it. We 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 are a research group that was forming or created in 2001, and we started applying as many other research groups in in Sibne. We started applying numerical methods and and computational flow dy dynamics based on finite element methods in the field of buildings. Spe specifically, uh, we started analyzing airflow in buildings, around buildings, within buildings. Then we noticed that maybe it was uh, rather limited to, to, to analyze the energy performance on buildings. And then it start, we, we started in 2002, 2003 to couple this computational fluid dynamics with dynamic transient uh, simulation softwares, which are softwares that go um, or simulate the, the, balance, the energy balances of, of a building and the heat transfer balances. In a, in a wider uh, environment, which is like a control volume. So we, for, for two, three years, we tried to couple both, both uh, software tools. But then in 2006, we started monitoring real buildings. Uh, it was uh, the starting point. And we noticed that the difference and the gap between these uh, energy performance simulation softwares and the real energy performance was was really very big. So at that moment, we, we decided that CFD maybe is not best option to go more into detail or to uh, analyze longer periods of like years or or months of the energy performance of buildings. And we get more centered in, 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 in developing data monitoring and energy management platforms to gather data and to start analyzing. In 2012, we uh, for for this period for a long six years we were centered in in um, working in softwares which are dynamic softwares that um, evaluate the the uh, the heat balances the mass transfer balances in in control volumes so you divide the building in three or four control volumes and you define the differential equations of each of them and and you get the solution. The problem is that this this kind of models I will uh, uh, um, I will explain later on are theoretical and based on empirical and physical based uh, equations, which are not really exactly uh, the uh, the same than than the reality. And so we, you need to perform very complicated calibrations with the reality. Uh, in 2012, we we thought that maybe it would be better to go one step beyond in the simplification of the modeling. And we started working with a concept of gray box modeling, which are uh, reduced order model models of the previous ones. And uh, in order to include, in some sense, the uncertainty of the data, uh, of the real data coming from the monitoring systems or even of the definition from the definition of the building, we started also working with the stochastic uh, differential equations. At that time, we also start 
uh, working with machine learning techniques and a statistically driven methods. And in parallel, we were started working with big data because we, we just started um, gathering massive amount of data coming from smart meters. And this process finished in 2017, where we finally decided that uh, from that point, we are going to get more center in data-driven, pure data-driven uh, forecasting and optimization models. Because um, the reality is that at this, from 2017 till now, the, the possibility of gathering massive amount of data is, is the reality and it can be uh, achieved and it's affordable. So this is the work in which we are now centering in, in, in developing simplified models because they are not so detailed as CFD or, or dynamic simulation softwares, but that allow us to perform a basic characterization of the buildings and also to predict and, and to forecast the, the energy performance. Yeah, if I'm going more into detail, as, as I said, the evolution goes like this one. We started with navier stoke differential equation solving through numerical methods and, and simulated the airflow in urban areas. Then we moved to the second slide, which uh, or the second picture, which is dynamic empirical me methods, in which you define a, a building as a, as a union or a join of different vol control volumes, and then you perform the analysis of the energy and mass balances, and these are physically based models. We then moved to gray box model. We still we are still working in gray box modeling in the, when we have enough data, which is a, a reduced order model, which can be understood as an electrical network in which you have resistance, uh, which uh, represent the heat transfer of the walls. And then you have nodes, which represent the, the state variables, which are the temperatures. But these models are, are very useful and very powerful. The problem is that you need to measure these state variables, and this is not always possible. So we finally moved to the more pure data or statistical learning and artificial intelligence math models, which are relation-based models. Um, and then there are different techniques you can use it. Um, here it, you can see the, the comparison of these three um, categories of, of models. The, the, the white is the, the physical world in which you can use deterministic equations, the tell to models, and you have a, a deep, deep physical knowledge of the buildings. And here you can use this dynamic performance modeling or CFDs. Then you have the gray box model in which you have less physical knowledge and you identify the, the unknown parameters based, based on the data you can gather. And finally, you have this black uh, box which represents the statistically data-driven models in which you are relatively far from the physical uh, knowledge or physical minimum of the buildings but on the other and on the other side you are completely um, based on the data you can you can gather and this is the, the scope of this uh, this uh, presentation so Gerard if you want to to start yeah, from now on more into detail yeah, but I will present. I will start to sharing my. my or if you screen. wanna, if you if you tell me, I can click. No, no, but it's it's better if I I'm do it. A moment. Yeah. I think that it's working. Is it working? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, basically. Uh, Using artificial intelligence, obviously. I think, sorry, I think that Jordi, you should stop uh, sharing your presentation. Uh, okay. Sorry, I'm trying it. Okay. Okay, so. Yeah, it was basically with artificial intelligence, I think that the most important thing uh, and the work uh, of a data scientist is uh, to gather data and prepare the, the data to, you know, to train the model. So uh, we, we will start it from here and uh, I will show you uh, some of the databases that uh, we are using for gathering data. Uh, 
uh, in big group. Uh, basically, uh, it all starts with the with the consumption meters. So it could be heat, gas, uh, electricity, or water meters, and then understand how uh, the, the the energy consumption in buildings is produced. And uh, we think that uh, this is a, a, a dichotomy between uh, the energy uh, behavior and the energy performance of buildings. So we need to uh, gather information uh, from the buildings, from from the cadaster. The, the Spanish cadaster has good, has good APIs in order to ob obtain this data. Also, uh, weather data. We we uh, we have connection with several uh, APIs, uh, private APIs in 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 website or online online services where we can obtain uh, solar radiation, temperature, wind speed, uh, wind direction, this kind of data. Also, it's interesting uh, sometimes to correlate uh, with national statistics data. The, the economic level of certain regions or these kind of things. And obviously, uh, we have to obtain data from uh, the energy behavior, so the, the set point and schedules of uh, users, uh, disaggregated uh, uh, consumption meters for thermal gains, uh, information from buildings, from, uh, from ECMs or the, the energy conservative measures, building typologies, these kind of things. Um, well, as I said, uh, basically this, how we gather this data, uh, the consumption meter data, it's uh, gathered through uh, EMMA API, which is our uh, big data platform. Uh, but also uh, regarding uh, consumption data, we, uh, we are now uh, obtaining aggregated data for, uh, by districts and postal codes and regions uh, with data this platform, which is the, the platform of uh, the Spanish distributors in Spain and they uh, they shared uh, the the consumption of the of 28 million uh, meters uh, but in an aggregated uh, version so we don't we don't have the individual uh, data of each meter but we have the the aggregated one and this is interesting for us to 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 analyze uh, this data uh, the cadastral data uh, sorry it, it appears here sorry the cadastral data it's obtained through uh, uh, the ATOM files of the of the Spanish cadaster, and as I said, the weather data is obtained from Dark Sky, uh, Meteo Galicia, and uh, Open Weather uh, API, and the Copernicus for the solar radiation is from from the uh, from the European Commission. Uh, normally, it's obtained through MAPI because it's it's general uh, information data from buildings and um, BM uh, uh, beam models or uh, ECMs obtained from, uh, for example, the the, the generated buildings or uh, data databases from governments and so on. And uh, the national statistics is obtained uh, through the INE uh, API in Spain and also national statistics institutes uh, apis from all around europe so uh, the first phase uh, working with data is that uh, we have to do the hypothesis uh, which is not wrong <laughs> uh, it's a fact uh, that the raw data it's never clean so uh, we have to uh, clean clean this data uh, sometimes we have uh, data redundancy problems so uh, we obtain for for uh, for example for a same building we obtain uh, different from different databases or from different sources we obtain different uh, building areas uh, and this is a problem because we 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 should have no uh, we should have to know uh, which is the which is the correct one but uh, with with these uh, cleaning processes and uh, we 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 just have to deal with that uh then for the time series um basically in general uh, what we do is to to make a padding of the of the data gaps and uh, normally assigning uh, na values when when data is unknown and uh well in more detail in consumption time series for example in electricity consumption time series uh normally we detect uh, outliers of uh, instant consumption uh, here not appears but uh, there was a, an equation but it's uh, very simple uh, we we remove the 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 negative values of instant consumption and also uh, 
using the, for example, the, the contracted power in the case of electricity or the, the amount of maximum power of uh, in heating uh, in heating consumption, uh, we have to to the, the the so the data have to be in the range of that uh, of that value. Uh, we also use uh, density-based uh, filtering in order to detect uh, days without uh, usage. Here it appears a plot uh, regarding that, and uh, also uh, we we uh, we filter uh, using the distrib uh, cumulative distributions when unchanged meters. In continuous variables such as uh, temperatures, uh, yeah, for example, if temperatures is a very good indoor temperatures or outdoor temperatures is a good uh, uh, example of these of these variables. We detect outliers sometimes using the Z normalization. Uh, I will I will show you later what is uh, the the Z normalization algorithm, and uh, also in the version of in the static version of or, or rolling or rolling windows uh, version where we use uh, moving average of uh, of the mean and the standard deviation, and uh, the data interpolation could be done uh, in this case in this in the continuous variables uh, data interpolation could be done if if the if the data gaps uh, that we have are small for example one or two hours using uh, linear or uh, kernel smoothers or uh, these kind of things then uh, once the data is uh, clean it then we we need to transform it uh, in order to use it uh, there's uh, in, in, in transformation of the of the data. Uh, there's uh, the category the, the categorical data. Sometimes we uh, we have this type of data in uh, in buildings uh, data sets uh, where we have to uh, to clarify the, the 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 nomenclature of the of the variables and also sometimes encode this uh, with numerical data. Uh, sometimes uh, we need to discretize uh, using equal equal width or equal frequency binning because uh, uh, some black black box models need to need to do that in order to uh, obtain uh, better results. Also, it's very normal to lock uh, transform. Um, numerical data in order to normalize uh, its results because with several, uh, for example, with ordinary list, uh, or ordinary regression, linear regression, uh, it's also another another transformation very typical in in uh, in this kind of uh, data. It's uh, the min max uh, scalar and also, sorry, uh, it appears the uh, the normalization some normalization method other normalization methods are the the Z normalization or the robust scalar and that Z normalization which uh, which is this this last uh, formula here uh, it's the the value uh, minus the the mean value of all the time series or all the window that we are dealing with divided by the uh, by the standard deviation. In the case of robust scalar, it's not the mean; it's the median, and uh, standard and the standard deviation is the interquantile range. Uh, also, another transformation uh, method that we use for numerical data is the moving average, which could have uh, plenty of uh, uh, variety of uh, wind of window widths, uh, aligns, and weights uh, in order to do that. Um, the, mo the most normal, the most normal uh, aggregation for this uh, for this type of uh, algorithm is the is the average, uh, but we could uh, we could do whatever whatever function that we that we need, um, and also it is very useful for uh, for the rolling the rolling version of this normalization. Uh, another transformation is the is the first order low pass filter of other variables, uh, which is very used uh, in our case, uh, because as you could presume, the the buildings are uh, do not um, change its uh, its be do not correlate directly with the for example with the outdoor temperature with the with the raw uh, outdoor temperature. In fact, they they have a, in, a inertia, so uh, they uh, well they tend to react uh, in less in more in in, in later in later uh, lags uh, 
uh, reactions of the of the of changes in the uh, outdoor temperature uh, affects the the consumption of the building. So with this uh, with this low pass filter uh, that we are dealing with, and we optimize this alpha this alpha value from uh, from this uh, formula. Uh, we can we can deal with that here in the in this plot. There are three examples of, uh, for example, with the with their black uh, time series, which is the the exterior temperature. We have the three examples of the low pass filtered temperature using three uh, values of alpha 06, 085, and 095, and we could see that. Uh, with the most uh, higher, with the higher uh, alpha, we could uh, we could filter uh, the 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 high uh, the high frequency changes and the, but the low the low frequency changes uh, are maintained in the in the time series. Another another transformation is the Fourier Fourier series, which is used for uh, for. Um, Transform the cyclic uh, time series, uh, especially in this case. Well, in this example, it's uh, it's uh, a time series, a not function time series, which could be, for example, the the day hour. Uh, in these examples, it appears uh, it appears the day hour in points in the, the black points of this uh, of this plot uh are the the original the original uh, day hours uh, in a time series and then uh, in red we have the cycle the odd function of the of the cycle uh, from from minus zero five to to zero five so with a one with one uh, with an amplitude of one and uh, we could obtain uh, the fourier series uh, which which are these uh, which are these um, well, this sinus from here, from the from the from the right, from the right plot, the with three harmonics in this case, the red, uh, the the green, and the blue, um, <clears throat> on the blue lines, uh, we could see the different amplitude of these uh, sinus signals because this is related with the number of harmonics of this uh, Fourier series, and those. Uh, and those transformations are very useful in order to we could uh, we could detect using uh, linear linear uh, coefficients we could detect nonlinear effects of uh, certain of certain variables for example the the, the day hour uh, in this case we I, I show you uh, two examples of uh, three uh, of a so um, a time series uh, sorry uh, a Fourier series of three uh, harmonics, uh, assigning three different values of of the an of the an uh, coefficients, and we could see that we could uh, obtain uh, three diff two different very two different uh, uh, shapes uh, that could be the relation of the of the hour of the day in the in the heating in the heating consumption or the electricity consumption okay so what we are what we will try to do is to obtain the optimal uh, the optimal coefficients the a1 a2 a3 in the using regression algorithms or black box models then uh, once uh, the data the data is prepared, one of the algorithms that we could uh, they could train, or one of the models that we could train, is uh, it's uh, for uh, with the object of of clustering uh, in order to obtain uh, representative daily load curves or or the most uh, common patterns of uh, occupants activity. Uh, also, clustering uh, groups of uh, dwellings or uh, or buildings in order to benchmark to benchmark uh, users and say, okay, you are consuming 100, and your similar buildings are consuming 110, for example. Uh, also, we are using this uh, in, for for the input of classification models uh, of occupants occupants activity or, or behavior, and the major techniques we we are using for this. Uh, for the clustering, it's it's the k-means, uh, the first one, which is which is a very uh, a broadly known uh, clustering uh, algorithm. 
uh, widely used in in many in many things, and it is basically it's an iterative algorithm that choose uh, centroids to minimize this formula, which is the so initially some some uh, some centroids are are randomly uh, selected, and then it's a, there is an iterative process in order to optimize the the final centroids that we obtain. Uh, how we could optimize this, uh, these clusters is the number of clusters is, uh, in this case, is with the silhouette, silhouette index or the davis Baldwin index, which makes it uh, quite, uh, normally it's quite difficult with real data, it's quite difficult to obtain uh, the, 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 uh, an optimal number or to be very clear in the to obtain the optimal number of clusters because uh, yeah in some examples are, are pretty uh, in the website in, in, in webs uh, you could see some examples with uh, for example uh, plants data and this kind of things that which is very very easy to to understand how 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 we could obtain the uh, the optimized the optimal number of clusters but uh, with real data of electricity consumption for example it's quite difficult uh, so that's why we we well we change uh, the initial uh, our initial uh, works with k means and we, right now we are using a gaussian mixture model which is a model based uh, clustering technique uh, so in this case, with uh, we are using the the Bayesian information criterion on uh, and the ECL for for optimize the number of clusters, which is much more clear in order to to attack uh, to attack the number uh, the optimal number of clusters. And uh, in this case, with this type of model, it's similar to to K-means, but uh, it is assumed that all the points are generated from a mixture of, uh, of several normal distribution with unknown parameters and the objective is to uh, understand which is which are these uh, which are these parameters um, okay so basic well here that, so it's okay uh, the input data that we are using for clustering it the building characteristics the daily load curves uh, yearly load profiles and weather indicators uh, for instance, uh, in the case of uh, daily load curves clustering, uh, we use a, a subset normally of the of the initial data set um, because uh, we want to obtain the or to to work with the only only train the model with the with the most representative days in terms of uh, user interaction. So we need to avoid uh, days with uh, standby consumption and uh, outstanding consumption. Uh, normally, the normalization uh, methodology that we are using for this clustering is that normalization also, but it could be also the, the percentage of uh, hourly consumption uh, versus the, the, day, the total daily consumption. Uh, it's also used in this case. Uh, then uh, there's also a lot of very well some differences between uh, if we are trying to clusterize uh, the data the, or the time series of data uh, of several uh, customers or only a single customer because sometimes we we want to cluster for example uh, the most common patterns of a whole uh, utility for example, so when we are trying to do that, uh, then we need to reduce reduce order of the of the daily load profiles, and we could use some dimensionality reduction methodology like PCA or LDA. Uh, but in the case of single customers, which is the most uh, common uh, common uh, well common algorithm that we are using right now, uh, is uh, is the we use the directly the the daily the daily load. Uh, curve uh, that have been detected uh, as representative for that user. Um, in the case of this of this daily dot curve clustering, there's uh, we evaluate uh, several type of models because this uh, this Gaussian mixture model uh, have uh, regarding the the parameters of the normal distributions. Uh, we could uh, we could evaluate uh, several models regarding the shape and the the, the tilt and the and the uh, volume of these of these uh, distribution distributions that are well are nice to to work with that. Here we have uh, some examples. 
uh, in the in the plot of the of the bottom uh, right, you have uh, the the ICL of different uh, models, uh, Gaussian mixture models. Uh, we see that two of them have the the higher uh, ICLs, and in this case, it's clear that the the ICL of uh, six uh, of six uh, clusters is the is the most uh, optimal. So uh, the representation of the load cores of these six clusters are uh, represented in the in the left plot uh, of here, and we could see the the cent that the centroids seems to be uh, quite uh, correctly uh, evaluated. Then uh, there is a classif the classification. Normally we we, we use uh, classification after the clustering uh, of uh, daily load curves. Uh, we make a classification process in order to classify all the data that uh, we didn't uh, use in the in the clustering in the clustering uh, algorithm. Okay, so in this case, no filtering of representative days is needed, and the the output for that is the input for other uh, forecasting models here he is uh, another example this is data from uh, from uh, a district okay a district uh, a postal code so the aggregated consumption of a postal code for different uh, tariffs uh, residential tariffs and uh, here we could see the representative uh, clusters of each of these of each of these tariffs and then in the in the left plot, uh, we see the classification. So each of the days, each of the each of the points represent one day, and uh, in what in which of the clusters is that day. So we could see that uh, certain part of the year uh, belongs to one cluster and certain points belongs to another. And well, the the, the information that we could detect with this uh, with this uh, classification process, clustering classification process. It's it's useful for uh, for characterize the in this case the the district. Then we we go to the modeling part uh, where the objective uh, the objective of these models are uh, uh, basically uh, forecasting and and characterization. Uh, in the case of forecasting, um, we could we, we, we could use it for uh, predicting one step ahead or multiple step ahead of some uh, variable of interest. For example, uh, the the electricity consumption, the indoor uh, temperature, uh, um, water uh, water tank temperature, or uh, some, something like that. And uh, the characterization some of some variable uh, of interest. It's also uh, use it in order to characterize um, data, uh, I'm sorry, characterize buildings or dwellings in terms of uh, the estimation of uh, heat transfer coefficient or uh, solar gains, uh, air leakage, and this kind of things. So first of all, uh, I will explain a bit uh, the residual evaluation that we are doing with these uh, modeling techniques in order to understand or to define which uh, which are the which are the best models if the model is fitting okay or it's overfitting or it or have uh, some problems um, the first the first error that we use to determine to, to to assess that is the mean average percentage error which is this one from here uh, which is very intuitive because uh, yeah, it says, okay, you are consuming or uh, the consumption of the real uh, measure, it's 10% more or 10% less or 5% less in the in that in that uh, time step. But it lacks when there are uh, real measurements uh, close to zero. So obviously there's here a, a, a division. So when uh, the values are close to zero, this, uh, this, ma this map, uh, uh, normally uh, goes to infinite uh, infinite values, so it's not recommended for a uh, high frequency consumption time series, uh, early uh, quarter early time series in this case. So for for solving that, we are use also the we're using also the the root mean square error, uh, which is a quadratic error, so it avoids uh, the problems when uh, an element uh, of the residual of the of the original time series is is close to zero <clears throat> and uh, it's an absolute error in this case so it has uh, the unit of the of the of the original time series um, 
and to solve that because then it's difficult to compare between different uh, between different uh, evaluations or different uh, uh, techniques we are using the coefficient of variance uh, of the root mean square error which is not more than the root mean square error uh, divided by the mean value of the original uh, time series um so it solved the the, the map drawbacks and uh, it also it's a relative error which is quite nice to to compare with others uh, another another interesting uh, residuals evaluation that we are using is the autocorrelation functions uh, which are used to detect correlations in model residuals so when it exists autocorrelation uh, the model the model is incorrectly specified so it faults some uh, some variable uh, or maybe the orders of the model are not enough in order to uh, to detect the dynamics uh, to sim to model the dynamics of the of the system okay i i like very much this uh, this um, this uh, well this sentence from here which is the it says the, the acf depicts how an error at one point in time travels to the subse subsequent uh, point in time so how we accumulate this this error in time and the pacf is the auto the correlation sorry uh, that results after removing the effect of any correlations due to the terms uh, at shorter lags so uh, for for uh, for being clear, more clear the pacf uh, it's used for for the uh, for the evaluation of the autoregressive orders in the in the in the rx models and uh, the acf it's it's very uh, easy to understand if if uh, we are committing uh, some some error in uh, that travels in time uh, in, in in the subsequent in subsequent point of time um here, uh, yeah, the the yeah the next point it's it's the the models the res the regression models in this in this case that we are uh, using, uh, which are the the linear models basically the linear models uh, recursive least squares models, um, then oops sorry, corregada. I don't know what, why that's not working, but uh, there is the linear models the recursive least squares models the Rx models and uh, the GAM, the generalized additive models. Okay, so for the first, uh, for this first, the, the, the linear models, um, it have a uh, fast training, so are quite uh, competitive uh, to use uh, in order to, we have uh, results, quite, uh, quite fast results. Uh, they are simple, which does not mean uh, that are inaccurate, but uh, we have to use them uh, in in certain in certain conditions. Uh, they are easy to uh, interpret its its results. Uh, we could deal with nonlinearities uh, using uh, Fourier series uh, or B splines in the input. Uh, I explained the Fourier series and the B splines. Well, it's another methodology that we are using to transform the initial data. Um, then it deals with uh, categorical and, uh, and numerical data as, as inputs. Uh, well, the, the output uh, have to be normal in ordinary linear models have to be have to be normal distributed. And uh, normally are trained along in in our case we normally train these these models along an optimization uh, methodology uh, to optimize other parameters like uh, the the balanced uh, point temperatures and low pass filter alphas and these kind of things. Then uh, the recursive least squares are similar models but uh, its coefficients. Uh, are time variant, so we have a, an evolution in time of the of the coefficients, and uh, in order to do that, we have to uh, we have to optimize a lambda, which is a forgetting factor uh, in the in the time in the time evaluation that we are that we are doing. I don't know what is happening, but it seems that <laughs> I don't have more. One moment. Ah, it seems that uh, it doesn't appear the, the formula here. Here there was a formula, and I don't know why uh, right now there is no the formula. Uh, okay, so 
this is an example of a, of a line, of, of several linear models in this case, uh, but you could see that we could uh, detect non-linearities, we could model uh, non-linearities, and the model is uh, still uh, linear. In this case, it's a model of, uh, of, uh, of the consumption of a district, uh, the, uh, the aggregated to four hours for the, uh, for the model, and for the plot, uh, the plots are aggregated uh, 24 hours, so each of the points is a consumption of one day, uh, compared to the, the, the average temp uh, outdoor temperature. Uh, in this case, uh, there are uh, several uh, several conditions uh, like the temperature balance uh, points and these kind of things that are uh, are interesting in order to evaluate uh, how these uh, coefficients are uh, changing in in time. Because uh, as we see here, uh, the the rows are the different tariffs of uh, of. Um, uh, of, of of the of the energy consumption, and in the in the columns we have the evaluation made uh, on a, a rolling window of one year, of uh, one uh, of a natural year. So, for example, in this last one, we have uh, evaluating uh, uh, data from July 19th to June 20. So we could evaluate if the if the um, consumption or the dependency uh, in winter or in uh, in cooling, uh, in, yeah, in winter or in in summer, sorry, uh, it's it's higher or lower in time. I don't know what is happening, but yeah, well, here here we see these uh, these things that I was saying. Uh, for example, this is an aggregation, a yearly aggregation of the of the of the later data, and we see for each of the for each of the tariffs how the base load, which could be the yeah the intercept, so the, the fixed consumption of uh, of uh, each of the tariffs are evolving in time. So we could see that in these tariffs, the users are are uh, consuming more in the in the during the during the the whole year, and then they have uh, much less uh, dependency in the in the cooling in the cooling uh, phase. Another uh, uh, regression model technique it's the IRX model, which is a, a dynamic model in this case. Uh, the outputs are uh, correlated. Well, it assumes that the, co the outputs are correlated with its, with its own lags and multiple uh, exogenous uh, variables. And uh, there's a process to optimize uh, the correct order of this of this lag, these auto uh, these autocorrelations, uh, which I said in the in the evaluation of the of the residuals. It's the, are the are the ACF, PACF, and the cross correlation function, which is the same like ECF, uh, but uh, uh, correlating, uh, for example, temperature and the and the output on the output uh, of the of the model. Uh, when use it for uh, for prediction, uh, in this case. We have to deal with the with the one step ahead, which is direct. The, the, the predictions with the one step ahead are quite easy because uh, we have all the real data of the when we do the prediction. We have all the real data that we that we need uh, in order to predict. But when we do the multiple step ahead, we have to uh, predict with the, the with already the predictions that we did in uh, in other in other steps. So. We are like uh, accumulating the error if if there's some error, but assuming that uh, we are in white noise, uh, this error should be should be quite low. Yeah, uh, another interesting thing of this of these models is that uh, we could interpret the the impulse responses that provides uh, these uh, autoregressive errors, and we could uh, infer a lot of information from that. Uh, this is an example of an autoregressive uh, model. Uh, here is the this is, this one from here is the backward backward shift operator uh, of the of the algorithm, and then uh, we have also backward shift operators for for the inputs. And uh, as we could see we, we could see here uh, that there, there are some interactions in the in the inputs of the 
of the model. <clears throat> so uh, basically uh, what we are trying to do here is to uh, characterize the, the, the solar irradiance, uh, well, dependency of the, cons of the, on the temperature. Uh, in the indoor temperature of a, of a household, depending on the the solar azimuth and the solar and the solar zenith, and also uh, the the wind uh, the wind speed uh, multiplied by the difference of temperatures uh, outside and uh, and indoor uh, the house, depending on the wind direction of the of the well of the of the location of that building, and also here, uh, as I said here in this point of the impulse uh, responses. Uh, there's this interesting, this interesting impulse response of the of the indoor temperature uh, in the building. So we we could see we could compare with other with other uh, um, households, for example, uh, how the inertia of the how the a degree of uh, of uh, indoor temperature affects to the other to the other uh, to the other lags of the or to the proceed to, to next uh, the next the next lags of the of the uh, in time of the variable of the output variable which in this case it's also the the indoor temperature yeah here uh, it's the generalized uh, additive model uh, slide which is uh, another another technique uh, another regression model technique uh, which basically it's it's a generalized linear model uh, where uh, the, the the linear responses uh, depends uh, linearly to to smooth functions or to splines okay so uh, it deals natively with uh, non-linearities uh, so in this case we could see here an example uh, the non-linearity between the the outdoor temperature and the and C, which is the the consumption in this case the electrical consumption of a of a building, and the same for the the uh, global horizontal irradiance and the and the consumption, considering also the sun azimuth in this case. Uh, it could also integrate uh, in this type of models. We could also integrate uh, an R process. So. It, in some sense, it's it's an extension of the uh, RX models. We, it's not the same, but uh, yeah, we could we could integrate this uh, at regressive uh, terms, you know, to transform it to to dynamic to a dynamic version. This uh, generalized additive model, uh, but computation the computational time uh, it's higher to it's obviously more uh, higher to compared with the uh, ordinary list uh, ordinary list squares uh, regressions. Another uh, other other black box models that we are using are the uh, gradient boostings for classification, for the classification, for example, of the of the clusters that I show you uh, later, and uh, random forest techniques, uh, which are quite similar. And well, uh, it depends here here the the random forest is trained with uh, uh, bootstrapping of the of the of the original data set and here it's quite different but uh, basically what we are using is uh, for the gradient boosting it's XGBoost uh, which is a well-known uh, library um, that it's implemented in in a lot of uh, of languages Python and R for example and uh, also uh, neural, neural networks and uh, and also one of the I think that the drawbacks that have this this kind of modelization is that uh, the hyperparameter hyper the hyperparameters tuning it's very important in order to uh, not overfit the the uh, our output or our variable of uh, of interest to to model uh, and it they have a very high computational time uh, compared to the to the regression models and not very very or much more uh, better results compared to to the to the regression models that we are using uh, considering that we are transforming uh, the, the input data for that models in in several in several ways uh, another thing that we are trying uh, at the moment it's the stack, stack ensembles 
which are basically, I had here a photo, but it doesn't appear here. I don't know why, what's happening, but uh, what well, I si could send you the, the, si the presentation. Si presentación, potser, si tros en mode presentación, no sé si es veurà. Ah, yeah, <laughs> okay. So here, here you see uh, an stacked ensemble. It's basically uh, a, a conjunction of different uh, models. Uh, and then the stacked ensemble, it's a, a, a meta model, which could be also another random forest or a gradient boosting or even a, a, a linear combination that is here. Uh, so an ordinary linear model uh, that combines all these, all the, the outcomes of this, uh, of all these models. Uh, in order to obtain another another prediction for uh, for that output, so uh, these these type of models are uh, widely used in uh, in Kaggle competitions, because, which is uh, I don't know if you know this uh, this platform, but Kaggle is a platform for uh, well well uh, data scientists from all around the world. Uh, try to do their best in order to win uh, competitions uh, of, of prediction of classification uh, problems or recommendation problems in order to to obtain well prices and this kind of things but uh, in the case uh, of uh, of our uh, in a study of, of our study uh, we use stacked ensembles for uh, for um, do better predictions for our forecasting models in some of the applications that uh, uh, Jordi will show you later. Um, and my last slides are this one from here, which is the, the optimization. Uh, for the optimization of, uh, of uh, model parameters or some control scenarios, that, uh, that, we, uh, that, we are, uh, that we are doing, uh, we are uh, <clears throat> optimizing using a genetic algorithm. Uh, which normally we use uh, binary optimization uh, because it discretizes uh, the possible solutions uh, of the uh, of the problems of the problem sorry and uh, and we construct uh, a, a good encode decode representations for even combinations of float integer and categorical uh, data uh, the major, I think that the major, uh, the major reasons to to use this genetic algorithm, which, which are in some sense high, which requires high computational time, uh, are because they are very flexible uh, in order to uh, be used in all kind of modeling algorithms. So we could test uh, different uh, modeling infrastructures, uh, so different black box models or. Uh, several regression techniques or whatever, and then and we use the same and we 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 have the same in in the same in the same optimization framework. So basically, this this is the reason that we are using this this algorithm. Uh, for the moment, we are normally uh, working with uh, single objective uh, optimization, which is simpler, but uh, the optimization should account for soft restrictions in order to obtain good results. For example, in the case of uh, optimizing uh, control scenarios, uh, the indoor temperatures should have uh, should have a, a soft restrictions, not hard restrictions, because if we if we don't deal with that, then we, the scenarios of optimizations uh, are not very optimal. Okay, so uh, then right now we are thinking in the in the evolving this uh, this uh, this objective to multi objectives uh, um, multi objective optimizations, which requires more computational effort. But uh, uh, some examples of these uh, multi objectives optimizations could be uh, optimization by cost and thermal comfort um, by cost and and emissions or by operational costs of the systems and the maintenance costs, for, for example, for heat pumps, which uh, turn on and off uh, continuously uh, heat pumps could uh, could uh, occasionate high maintenance uh, cost in the in infrastructures. And basically, well, this is the this is my presentation. And right now, Jordi will start on. Yes, maybe before starting uh, explaining some applications, some practical applications of these methods, uh, does anybody have a question or is there anybody 
interesting in in some comments or something like that because maybe now it's the time to yeah mm. well i think that maybe if somebody has questions we can let them for the end if you want okay. you can keep going for the moment okay so Gerard, maybe you can yeah, uh, yeah. i will stop so i i will show you uh, some examples of practical applications of these of these uh, methodologies and the first one is uh, i start i i i am I'm, I'm owning the the, the screen oh, yeah, right yeah, now I ah, you want to okay, okay. Well, I think it's better. Right it's there. it's better if you if you okay, do okay. that. Okay, okay, I'll do it. You know, to set this uh, next slide, next slide. <laughs> yeah, we're looking at your screen, Jordi. Now. Okay. Do you see it? Okay, here uh, you can see. Well, uh, an example of of application was uh, a project called Sim for Blocks, in which we were, we were working in a building, well, in a block of buildings in San Cugat. Um, and it, it was a system, a centralized system for by a water tank of uh, 3,500 3, liters. And then we have uh, two heat pumps of 60 kilowatts that are delivering um, heating and cooling to this tank. This tank then distributes the water, hot water or cold water to 33 offices, four shops and one local food market in two different rings. So the idea was to make these, these uh, two heat pumps run when the price of the electricity in the day ahead market, which is the normal market we, we all the users are buying, um, when the, the hours are cheaper. Uh, so this was what we performed and we did it by, um, first of all, by um, simplifying this uh, physical meaning of this uh, system using uh, uh, autocorrelation, um, autocorrelation model to, to uh, simulate the water time temperature and the heat consumption of the heat pumps. And then we perform an optimization every time step, which is called a model, model predictive control, to make these heat pumps run when the signal, which is the price, is lower. And this was the, the scope of this, of this application. Here you can see the, the results of, because we performed this simulation, sorry, uh, I don't know how to make this out, but yes. Here you can see the, the day ahead price and, and this uh, tariff was, uh, had two levels. This is the typical discrimination hour um, uh, tariff in which you have the higher price in, during the day and then a lower price in the night. And here you can see this was the normal uh, power consumption of the heat pumps without any optimization. And as you can see, there are some hours in which the price is expensive where, where the heat pumps are activated. And there are two, two different uh, energy performances of, of the system. And here you can see the optimized power after applying the regression model and the optimization procedure. And the, the big difference can be seen here in this period, in this last period, where you can see that when when the 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 price is is higher, there's no there's no consumption. And this was the the, the objective of, of this uh, approach. And the benefits of it can be quantified in, in the accumulated cost for this period of two weeks. And you can see the baseline situation in which the, the building uh, is forecasted or, or it is uh, predicted without the, any kind of optimization and the effect of the optimization. And we, we evaluated an 18.5% 80, 80, 18 of, of cost savings that can be achieved in two weeks. Is, uh, this is an example, and once once we we perform this, we want it because in, in some sense this kind of of actuations is like uh, providing flexibility to our systems, in the sense that we send a signal, which in this case is a price, and uh, we uh, modify the the activity power, and this is called flexibility in, in the energy world. It's called flexibility. 
and uh, even there are some markets in which you can sell this flexibility. There are some markets that are called the secondary, secondary and tertiary and electricity markets in which a company can pay to you uh, if you deactivate or if you activate some percentage of power in your system. And in order to participate into these markets, it's very important to quantify the potential flexibility of your system. And the way that uh, we use to, to quantify this percentage is what is called the energy uh, flexibility model or the energy flexibility function, which is this linear regression model, which are also with a, um, uh, autocorrelation um, term, which is this one. And here you can see the, the activated power, which is the power once the optimization is applied, how it is um, performed or how it is correlated with the baseline forecasting and with the signal, which in this case is the day ahead electricity price. So with the data we, we gathered from the operation period, we then identify these parameters, these unknown parameters, and you can obtain this uh, simulation that it's, it's, it's represented here in the right as the, as the red line. Here in the, the, um, the black line is the activated power. Uh, it's the same um, time series I showed you in the previous slide. And in, the, in red, you can see the, the model of, the, of, the, of this activated power. Um, in function of the the baseline and the day ahead price. Here, these two periods, this this gray um, uh, painted uh, periods are the validation periods, and the other periods are the training, the training periods, the data we use for the training and the data we use for the modulation of the model. And here you can see an examples of autocorrelation functions and partial autocorrelation functions. These these lines are are the um, the boundaries of, of the accuracy, and you can see that all the all the lags are within this this boundary. So it means the the model is validated, and we can assume that uh, it performs well, and it can be used to determine the the flexibility function. So if we if we then use an, an impo a treatment of this model, with uh, we can obtain the impulse function of the flexibility, which here can be represented in power. And, and this is an example of another another building, but because I show you because it's very graphical and can be easily understood. Here you have a, a, a signal of uh, act deactivating one kilowatt of uh, it's the same system as a heat pump, and then we make the order of deactivating it one power, uh, one kilowatt of power, and this is the response. And and the response depends on two levels of temp of outdoor temperatures because. It's a, it's a heat pump, and it's, well, I don't know if you if you know in detail, but a heat pump, the, the 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 coefficient of performance of a heat pump depends on on the outdoor temperature. So here you can see that if you deactivate, you make the order of deactivating one kilowatt, the the heat pump deactivates um, more or less 0 0.7, and then it, it has a rebound effect to recover the the previous situation and you can see for how it is changing if we, we increase the signal so this is a standardized way to show what happens if you um, make uh, or if you send signals to buildings and this is very common in the uh, in the world of demand response and here is, is an example how how the all the machine learning techniques can be applied to obtain these uh, flexibility functions. And uh, I think that's all for our presentation. So now if you have questions or if you want. To... Thank you very much, uh, Jordi, for a nice presentation. And also thank you, Gerard, more. Uh, sorry, and sorry for the intrusions today. Uh, next time we're going to be more, I don't know, more careful when uh, giving access to people, but it's very difficult. We, we need to think on, on a way to, to solve this. Anyway, so if there aren't any questions, uh, please feel free to open the mic and, and ask. I have one question. Um, well, two, in fact. Uh, you talked at the beginning about uh, the white box, the gray box, and the black box, and that you were going to focus on the black box, let's say. 
the more uh, statistical data and treatment of data. Uh, I was wondering, have you ever tried to work on the gray box in the sense of combining statistical methods with uh, deterministic methods, for instance, to improve or enhance the artificial intelligence uh, models? Yeah, yeah. If you want, well, we, yeah, we, we, we was working in, well, we are working in, in gray box models using a, a, a package which is called CTM, CTM uh, R, uh, which deals with the stochastical differential equations. So in some sense, it is mixing the, the statistical learning and the, the gray box modeling. Uh, so yes, but the problem with this uh, type of modeling is that you need uh very good data <laughs> and and uh even we we are we are working in several uh in several uh projects and uh, european projects or national projects or uh, catalonia projects we didn't reach the quality of uh, of data until yeah until now we didn't reach in any of the projects the the, the enough quality of data in order to perform good uh, analysis with this kind of techniques. So we have to deal with uh, with black box models, which are not bad in several, uh, in, in the, for example, in the applications that Jordi was was showing, which is the first, the first of, of it was uh, an MPC model. Uh, you, ha you have to deal with an R R RX model because the, the data from the, from the heat pumps uh, SCADA of that building, yeah, it have a lot of uh, out of gaps, a lot of uh, outliers. Uh, even uh, they don't know if the if the data it's correctly aligned between the time steps and the <laughs> and the meter readings. This kind of thing. So you could not apply a differential equation in this uh, <laughs> with these situations. So that's why we are working with uh, basically in, in dynamic models with uh, RLX models or or gamma models. Yeah, okay. and, 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 and before we, we arrive at the conclusion that for, for real data, the best option or, or the most feasible option is to use a black box, we also try to, we, are, we have some papers published on this, we, what we tried was to enhance the, the properties of, of the uh, dynamic simulation models by uh, generating um, a high amount of, of scenarios to calibrate them. And, and the idea was to artificially generate random, almost random um, uh, values of the parameters for, for, uh, that are used in the, in the differential equations. And then in, in this process, we introduce some statistical knowledge. In, in order to calibrate them. The problem was that it's, it's, it's a very complex process because the, the, um, the gray box models are reduced order models, so we, they are more simple. Yes. Yes. But in the other case, there are too many parameters to be calibrated. And, and so, and with the, with the gray box models, even although they are very simple too, uh, the quality of data is, is, a, is a critical point, but also the number of, of parameters can be also too high for, for real situations. So in the end, this is why we are we are more centered in black box modeling. Okay, great, thanks. But I uh, recommend you to use this CTSMR uh, library if you want to yeah. okay. <laughs> get inside this kind of <laughs> modeling. Yeah, we also forget to mention that uh, the normal softwares we are using to, to implement uh, yeah my question was my second question was uh, about that what okay. software do you use or what are you using normally we, we combine we the most one we use is R the uh, well-known statistical uh, software R and all, all the different packages of R but however we also use some some libraries of, of Python so in, in we combine both but for the last times, we are more centered in, in using R. And, okay. and, and the package that uh, was mentioned by Gerard is called CTSMR, and is a package developed by the Technical University of Denmark, who are specialists on this, on this field. And it's a very, a very strong package that, yeah, that combines these empirical yeah. gray box models with a stochastic uh, 
analysis. It's a very, very interesting package. But Thank yeah, the software we are using are, are always uh, open source uh, ones. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I, that, those were my two questions. I don't know if, uh, if there is somebody else who wants to ask something. If no, uh, let's end the seminar here. Uh, thank you very much, Gerard and Jordi, again, for this nice presentation. I'm sorry for the intrusions today. I'm going to cut the video in those parts, so don't worry. <laughs> yeah. We're not going to give the troll protagonism, so don't, don't worry. Um, okay. So yeah, that's it uh, for today. Thank you all for coming, for attending to this session. Uh, and I hope to see you in two weeks in the next session. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.